Wonderful. All right, well, good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us as we celebrate the Community Project Funds that we have delivered to help expand the City of Boston's free community college tuition program. It is long past time that we make robust investments in access to higher education. First, I want to give a special thank you to President Edinger and Bunker Hill Community College for hosting us today. Thank you for all that you do for our students. President Biden recently signed the annual government funding bill, which included millions in federal funding for 10 community projects across the Massachusetts 7th Congressional District, totaling some $8 million. That federal funding is the result of nearly a year's worth of advocacy by my team and our local partners includes $1 million in direct targeted spending to support the City of Boston's tuition-free community college programs expansion. There's absolutely no doubt that expanding this program with these federal dollars will enable us to do, will serve a critical need within our community and help more students achieve their goals of earning a college degree. At every level of government, we have a responsibility to fight for education equity and justice and programs like this are a great example of how we can increase true access to, edu to higher education. Uh, I also uh, want to extend um, my gratitude uh, to my, my sisters in service here, uh, Mayor Michelle Wu and former Mayor uh, Kim Janey, whom we uh, initially uh, started this application process with, I thank them for their efforts in advocating uh, for this program. The advocacy for the community project funding spans two history-making mayoral tenures. Mayor Janey and her team in putting forward this specific project funding request last year, and again, Mayor Wu has been a meaningful partner in our shared pursuit of accessible and debt-free college. I also want to thank now Labor Secretary Walsh for his commitment to supporting tuition-free college initiatives like this one during his time in the corner office at City Hall. I would also like to thank our delegation colleagues, Senators Warren and Markey, for their partnership in helping to move these funds through the Senate. And finally, I want to thank and acknowledge the Chief of Economic Opportunity and Inclusion, Sagun Itawu, for his commitment to economic equity in his role and honestly, as his life's work, and to the Director of Workforce Develop Development, Trin Wynn, for creating this program and for her continued partnership with my office and incredible partners like Bunker Hill Community College. A lot of work and sweat equity and laboring of love was spent on this, and I look forward to our continued partnership as we work towards ensuring our higher education system is truly affordable and accessible to all. Because for too long, the dream of a higher education has remained out of reach. And for millions, including the more than 855 federal, 855,000 federal student loan borrowers here in the Commonwealth alone, it has come with a very steep price tag and decades of debt. The college affordability and unprecedented 1.7 trillion student dollar debt crisis has disproportionately impacted black and brown borrowers and communities here in the Commonwealth and across our nation. There is no coincidence. It was due to decades of precise and intentional divestment and underinvestment in our communities, colleges and public universities, our HBCUs, and federal financial aid programs like Pell Grants. It is the result of generations of structural racism, which has prevented black and brown families from building wealth, forcing us to take on higher levels of debt just for the same shot at a college degree. These are the interconnected crises that require and deserve bold and innovative solutions at all levels of government, which support our communities and families and invest in higher education as the public good that it is. It's programs like Boston's tuition-free community college, which will improve education outcomes and lower costs for our students that will help us address these crises upstream while we also continue to work with the White House and to lead the fight in the House to pursue student debt cancellation. And we are closer than ever before. This crisis is urgent and we must leverage every tool and approach available to us 
I'm proud to say that our movement to cancel student debt has never been stronger, and I look forward to continuing to make the case to President Biden to use his executive authority to get this done. Because it is clear we cannot have a just and equitable recovery from this pandemic-induced recession without addressing the college affordability crisis that is crushing the dreams and economic futures of folks here in Boston and throughout the country. We often hear people talk about how the pandemic has laid bare and exacerbated every inequity. What are we going to do about it? Certainly a return to a pre-COVID status quo is not acceptable. So I'm incredibly proud to be here today to deliver this million dollar federal investment in the city's tuition free community college program. And I'm thankful to everyone here today for being partners in this work to create a more just and equitable Boston. And now I will turn it over uh, to our distinguished mayor, uh, who has been a steadfast partner uh, in this endeavor, Mayor Michelle Wu. Good morning. Thank you so much, Congresswoman. Thank you, Madam President. Thank you to all of our student tour guides who gave us just a little taste of the magic that happens here, the community that you are part of, and also a, a bit of the vision that's ahead. So to Myron and Corey and Genesis and Iman and, and Michael, uh, you are, you're an inspiration for all of us and uh, your stories, your leadership is exactly why we are here today, why we are so thrilled to be part of this announcement that under the Congresswoman's leadership, under Mayor Janey's leadership, and so many who have been part of that, that effort at all levels on our teams, this is a million dollars in funding that will go directly to making sure we are closing gaps and keeping and wrapping around our leaders, uh, young leaders, as they are building our, our future. This million dollars to fund and expand Boston's tuition-free community college program is a major step forward at just the right moment. Research has shown that many of our community college students are affected in their ability to stay in class and stay enrolled because of the juggle that real life imposes, taking care of kids, managing the needs for housing and food and all of, all of the, the many ways in which the pandemic stresses has made that juggle even harder. So funding like this will not, go, not only go to our students here, but to the families and the neighborhoods and communities that they are part of. We want to encourage even more students. We heard a little bit from um, Madam President about the toll that the pandemic has taken on enrollment numbers and the impact that that has had. This will be a major way that we can help support boosting those numbers and supporting all of our students who are, are coming back. Currently, this program, the uh, tuition-free community college program, currently supports 860 Boston public school students in their higher education. This funding will ensure that 600 more students and residents are supported by this last dollar program. And we've already received over 200 applications for this next school year in fall of 2022. And the application is still open. So for all who are eligible and interested, the website, I'll just say it here, it's, you can also find it on the city website, but it's owd.boston.gov slash TFCC. OWD standing for Office of Workforce Development boston.gov slash tfcc tuition free community college this funding will also seed an additional six million dollars of arpa funding um, so thank you congresswoman for your role in that as well um, this federal recovery funding will truly be able to expand the proposed budget and impact of this program uh, and workforce training programs one a, a few examples of how the these dollars are being stretched and multiplied and doing double triple duty Many of our participating colleges, including right here at Bunker Hill, offer incredible training programs for childcare workers. This is an area of tremendous need across every community, every neighborhood, every demographic in Boston. And so to change that dynamic, we need the talented workforce to have the supports and skill set and placements that we can make available through this funding as well. 
So we are creating space for more students to pursue certi certifications in early childhood education through this funding. It is also an opportunity to prepare the next generation of leaders for the green economy. Just last month, we launched a program to train current city workers, Madison Park High School students, and students at the Benjamin Franklin Cummings Institute of Technology in electric vehicle maintenance, which will be paired, for, paired with an investment to procure 20 electric school buses in Boston, which then will feed right into the, the workforce development and future job prospects and, and workforce in our city. BFIT, Bunker Hill Community College, and many of the participating schools already offer climate-related programs and are right at the cutting edge of many of these. And so uh, we know that this investment is an investment in all of our collective future. I'm grateful to all six of the participating schools, Bunker Hill, Massasoit, Mass Bay, Roxbury Community College, Urban College of Boston, and again, the Benjamin Franklin Cummings Institute of Technology. So thank you so much to the Congresswoman for helping us bring even more opportunities for our young people and joining in creating a future where we are more climate conscious, where education is truly accessible, and where we all have the opportunity to thrive. All of us deserve the option to pursue a higher education, and today is one more step in making sure that all truly reflects all. Uh, and I want to echo and uh, thank the Congresswoman for her leadership and advocacy also on a related issue as mentioned that right now in our country, in our city, if you want to pursue a higher education, you should be able to do so without being buried in debt for years to come. The student debt crisis is a racial justice issue, it's an economic justice issue, it is deeply tied to our recovery and the prospects that we will have in attracting, retaining, and supporting the workforce that we need in Boston. We know students of color, black and brown students, take on disproportionately more debt and carry that debt for much longer, which also widens the racial wealth gap that our team is working on so many fronts to narrow, close, and eliminate. The student debt burden is even deeper where identities intersect, as women carry the majority of student loan debt, and black women carry the most student debt out of any racial gender identity. So I stand with the Congresswoman and so many others in calling for debt cancellation especially for those with the largest debt burden. We know this is possible. We know this is within the authority of um, the, the leaders in office right now, and we know that this is critical to making sure that we have the foundation for our future. Okay, um, as we like to make sure in, in Boston that we can uh, reach even more of our residents and more media, uh, otra vez en español, Muchísimas gracias, congresista Presley, por conseguir un millón de dólares de financiación para ampliar la universidad comunitaria gratuita en Boston. Ese es un paso muy importante. Sabemos que muchos estudiantes de colegios comunitarios dejan sus estudios porque deben trabajar para mantenerse a sí mismos, a su familia y financiar su educación mientras estudian. Pero con una financiación como esta podemos ayudar a más estudiantes a permanecer en sus programas. Actualmente, el programa apoya a 800 estudiantes en las escuelas públicas de Boston. Esta financiación garantizará que otros 600 estudiantes y residentes se beneficien de este programa. También hemos propuesto unos 6 millones de dólares adicionales como parte del presupuesto para ampliar programas de formación laboral. Esos programas incluyen nuestros programas de educación infantil y muchas de nuestras universidades participantes, como aquí en Bunker Hill, ofrecen increíbles programas de formación para cuidadores de niños. También es una oportunidad para preparar a la próxima generación de líderes de la economía verde. El mes pasado, lanzamos un programa para entrenar a los actuales trabajadores de la ciudad, a los estudiantes de Madison Park y a los uh, estudiantes de Benjamin Franklin Institute of Technology en el mantenimiento de vehículos eléctricos. Estoy muy agradecida a las seis escuelas particip participantes, Bunker Hill, Massasoit, Mass Bay, Roxbury Community College, Urban College of Boston y Benjamin Franklin Cummings Institute of Technology. Así como a la congresista Ayana Presley por ayudarnos a brindar aún más oportunidades a nuestros estudiantes. Todos merecemos la opción de cursar estudios superiores y todos lo merecemos. 
Si quieres continuar con una educación superior, superior deberías poder hacerlo sin preocuparte por deudas. Y la crisis de la deuda estudiantil es también una cuestión de justicia racial. La carga de la deuda estudiantil es aún más profunda donde se cruzan las identidades. Las mujeres carguen con la mayor parte de la deuda de los préstamos estudiantiles y las mujeres negras son, que son las que más deudas estudiantiles tienen de todas las identidades raciales y de género. Debemos cancelar la deuda estudiantil y estoy orgullosa de estar aquí junto a la congresista Presley en apoyo de la cancelación de la deuda estudiantil. Gracias a todos. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Mayor. And uh, now we'll hear from uh, another uh, Shiro of mine and a partner in this work. And I think in many ways uh, a leader, uh, not just for the Commonwealth, but uh, is stewarding the helm here of a model in many ways uh, for the country. And that is President Pam Ettinger. And Congresswoman Presley, our friend, thank you so very much for your fierce commitment to making higher education accessible to all Bostonians. The funding you have secured for the Boston Tuition Free Community College Program means so much to our students. It means upward economic mobility, means closing the wage and wealth gaps, and for many, breaking free of generational poverty into economic vibrancy. A recent Mass Inc. study showed us that every dollar spent on getting our students' credentials will return a dollar eighty in economic value. This tuition-free community college program is no gamble. It is the sure thing. So thank you for supporting this investment in the public good of our city and our commonwealth. And Mayor Wu, our other friend, <laughs> We thank you for your vision and your leadership in expanding this Boston tuition-free community college program. You have long known what others are just beginning to learn, that community colleges are critical to providing universal college access and vital to the work of making Boston a truly inclusive city where all can thrive and prosper. Bunker Hill is the community college for the city of Boston. A quarter of our students walk across graduation stages every year from BPS. And there's great appetite for college and workforce training in our city. And this program will ensure that there is a clear path from high school to college to a vibrant career. The demand is real. There's great appetite. The growth is real. And the difference this program will make in the lives of our students is real. In this, in this COVID recovery, the short-term training provision added to this program will make our impact even greater. So Congresswoman Presley and Mayor Wu, thank you again to you both on behalf of our students and our trustees. Um, thank you for your friendship and for your vision. And now for us to uh, better understand exactly uh, what an investment in our human infrastructure uh, like this will mean uh, and what it has the potential to yield, uh, we will hear from um, two students. And the first will be uh, Corey Langlaw, and then we'll hear from Myron Adamson. Hi guys, I'm Corey. Um, my major is biology, hopefully going into marine biology. Um, a little bit about myself. Um, I have a bachelor's degree outside of this. I'm actually going for another degree um, in, uh, like I said, biology. Um, so that kind of creates a financial bind, you know, where I'm almost depleting my financial aid uh, from my previous degree. Um, so 
it's it's been hard to um, pay things out of pocket to um, make ends meet um, in terms of living costs and uh, utilities, so on and so forth. So I think this program is a really good opportunity for so many people in um, as Boston residents to uh, utilize this and um, not have to be a, a Boston Public uh, student in order to take advantage of this and just have to at least live in Boston and um, get the help they need. Um, anything else? <laughs> <laughs> I think that's good. Thank you. <laughs> Myron Adamson, and I am a mathematics major here at Bunker Hill Community College. Uh, Boston native, uh, born and raised. Um, what can I say? Uh, I intend to go on to uh, earn my four-year degree at a local institution. Uh, considered uh, two state schools, of also um, considering uh, two private schools as well. However, um, the great work that Congresswoman uh, Presley and Mayor Wu and our dear President Enniger would definitely help to uh, lighten the load, uh, light, lighten the uh, financial load for someone like myself. Uh, that way we can focus more on the purpose of getting the education. Um, I'd hate to have to be at a time like this in final exams as we're going through now and have to worry about, oh well, how am I gonna pay for this? Um, it is a responsibility that we have to accept, but um, the, the work that they're all doing is a boon to myself and uh, to our college community. So uh, thank you all for your work and your efforts. Um, we're all blessed to have you all. Uh, thank you, uh, Corey. Thank you, Marvin. And you know, I would just um, you know add as I was talking earlier about the the disproportionate or the disparate impact and burden on, on Black and Brown borrowers. Um, you know, if we purport to truly live in a meritocracy and um, do in fact believe that education is life's great equalizer, uh, the challenge here is that many thought that by encouraging more uh, immigrants and people of color to pursue higher education that it would close the racial wealth gap, but it has in fact only deepened it. Um, and that is why it is uh, so critical that we're making this investment um, today, uh, again in our human infrastructure, uh, in our workforce uh, and in the uh, robust contributions that they will go on to make uh, to this city and to our commonwealth. Uh, and that, in my opinion, is the greatest return on investment um, that we could ever have. All right, and so now the moment you've all been waiting for, and that is that we're going to take a quick picture um, before we get a few questions from the press around community funding, um, our community uh, project funding. And uh, I want to uh, officially present this, uh, this check here. So, A million dollars. They don't know what to do. <laughs> Grab it. <laughs> That's what you do. <laughs> Any questions? 
Before I get to next steps, let me just say that um, if you're not outraged, you're not paying attention. Forced birth, a challenging of settled law. Um, you know, myself and uh, many other reproductive justice advocates uh, have been uh, sounding the alarm for a very long time. And uh, I think we were characterized as um, being hysterical. Um, and it gives me certainly no joy that uh, many of our worst fears are coming to pass in this moment. And this is one more demonstration by the far-right extremism of the Supreme Court to obstruct the will of the people. Well, if you wait, is settled law, and majority of Americans want it to remain as such. But this Supreme Court has obstructed the will of the people on voting rights, on housing rights, uh, and now on bodily autonomy and reproductive freedom. Uh, first, let me just be clear that Roe v. Wade is still the law of the land, and abortion is still legal in Massachusetts. There are uh, many efforts going on uh, with abortion uh, fund uh, grassroots efforts and support networks that are here uh, to help you. Do not cancel your appointment. If you need access to care, please reach out to a provider immediately. This is not a drill. If this ruling does become final, safe abortion care will be pushed further out of reach for millions. And we know as we've seen with the draconian state bans that have been introduced in places like Texas and Mississippi, that bans do not stop people from pursuing health care and abortion care is health care. It just means that you are putting their lives at risk. And in Massachusetts, and I commend our state legislature, although we do have the Roe Act, what we will see if this becomes real is we will see a spillover from neighboring states where people do not have access. Uh, so um, this is something that should be a priority to everyone. This is why we have to organize, mobilize, and legislate like our lives depend on it, because they do. Congress has to stand in the gap in this moment and codify the right to abortion care into law, and the Senate must abolish the filibuster and pass the Women's Health Protection Act now. Uh, this is a piece of legislation that has been reintroduced in every Congress since 2013 by Congresswoman Judy Chu. Uh, in uh, the last uh, reintroduction of this bill, I was an original co-sponsor in my role as the chair of the Abortion Rights and Access Task Force under the Pro-Choice Caucus. This is, in fact, the first pro-choice majority Congress in the history of Congress, and that must mean something. Uh, I am encouraged that Leader Schumer has indicated that there will be uh, some effort taken up by the Senate, the Senate uh, to codify uh, Roe v. Wade, but um, I I'm also incredibly worried that if this does become real, that this is a frightening bellwether of what could be to come. Again, this is settled law. And, um, you know, from voting rights to housing rights to reproductive rights, it's clear the Supreme Court is just not on the side of the people, not on the side of justice. And if final, this opinion would take a straight aim at the fundamental right to privacy as well. So we're talking about reproductive rights, the right to contraception, the right to marry who you love. So this ruling uh, really has the potential to establish a very dangerous precedent that would allow the court to undermine other fundamental human rights. Uh, so um, in my opinion, the next steps are that uh, the, the Senate needs to step up and codify Roe v. Wade. And we need to abolish the filibuster. Yeah, it seems like the vote's just not there right now. Do you think there's anything the president can do? Is there an executive order? Is there anything along those lines that can be done? I think we have to explore every single option on the table. 
And um, you know, you you know me well, and uh, you know certainly I have a strength of uh, conviction and, and hope that I'm uh, unflappable and undeterred uh, in the face of a landscape that can seem uh, not promising. I mean, student debt is just one such example and issue. Student debt cancellation, an issue that seemed uh, to many marginal, uh, and that uh, there was not a prospect of that happening, and we're closer than ever before. So. Um, you know, I think we need to employ and engage uh, every tool and tactic available to us, and we need to organize and mobilize and legislate like lives depend on it because they quite literally do. If the Supreme Court is, as you say, uh, against the will of the people, um, in your view, what is the purpose of the Supreme Court now? What purpose does it serve? Well, you know, uh, again, uh, at this time, uh, what we have seen, given the imbalance in the far-right extremism of the courts, is that they have obstructed the will of the people. Uh, you know, I'm excited uh, that uh, Justice uh, Kataji Brown Jackson uh, will soon uh, officially uh, take the bench, and I'm certainly as supportive of legislative uh, efforts uh, by Representative Mondaire Jones and Hank Johnson to expand the courts. Uh, some people think that uh, that is. Um, precedent setting, but in fact it's not. Congress has done that seven times before. Uh, and I think in, in doing that, that might get us to uh, more of the fairness and the balance that is necessary. I would hope that at a minimum their role would be to uphold settled law. So, you know, again, that's why this, uh, this precedent is. And, and this burden will be disproportionately uh, bore by, by low-income and marginalized communities, black, brown, indigenous, AAPI, disabled. Um, again, people will not stop seeking uh, health care, uh, abortion care um, when they are in need. They just will put their lives at risk to get that care. Any other questions? Going back to the uh, student loan cancellation, I know that there are many, many parents have uh, Parent plus loans with multiple children, so the parents have, have that debt burden as well as any any to adding that to the net cancellation for students. I feel like you've been with me as I've been moving in and out of community here. Um, I can't tell you the number of parents that have approached me uh, in their upper 60s and early 70s, saying that they will not be able to retire uh, because they are still paying on loans that they co-signed for their children. This is a nearly two trillion dollar crisis. And you know the fact that in the beginning there were some very harmful, uh, false narratives about who would stand to benefit from student debt cancellation as if it would be regressive in impact, um, that this would only benefit white graduate students who went to affluent schools. That is a false narrative. You know, again, we have an entire generation that's hostage to this debt that can't uh, purchase a home, start a business, start a family, grow a family. Senior citizens in my district, 76 years old on fixed incomes, still paying on student debt. Teachers, educators who, who incurred this debt because they wanted to be nation builders. They're passionate about pouring into our children. And because of the cost of living uh, in, the Bos in Boston, which the mayor and I are working conservatively on, um, they can barely afford the monthly minimums. And they actually, as penalty, risk losing licensure because of that. So this is a nearly $2 trillion crisis affecting people from every family model and every walk of life. The president has the authority to alleviate this burden and this hardship. This hardship. It's an economic justice issue. It's a gender justice issue. Two thirds of this $2 trillion crisis is bore by women. It's a racial justice issue. And in fact, you've seen the presidents of historically black colleges and universities using ARPA funds to cancel student debt given the disparate burden on black and brown borrowers because of policies like redlining, which denied our family's ability to build generational wealth. Now, we've been very successful, and the administration has heeded our call in uh, pushing for student debt, uh, student loan pauses during the pandemic. So we're now in the third pause, and we've heard from people that they've been able to remain safely housed, purchase essential goods. Some people even became first-generation home buyers. So if that's what we've seen in a two-year period, imagine just how transformative it will be when President Biden, by executive action requiring no action by Congress, unilaterally, stroke of a pen, cancels broad-based student debt. And of course, uh, myself, Senator Warren, and Leader Schumer have been advocating for $50,000 because that will uplift 
and alleviate the burden for 80% of those in the lowest income bracket. Um, and then two, two last points on this. I don't know if you all are aware, but 40% of those who are saddled by this uh, debt don't even have a degree. You know, so again, um, I mean, this is just um, great harm is, has, been, uh, has been caused here. And I think this is also an effective strategy to boost our economy as we begin to, you know, come out of the pandemic and, and head into uh, recovery. We want to leave no one behind. But these issues do really work hand in glove. You know, what brings us here today to talk about this $1 million investment in tuition-free college? Because, of course, canceling this debt does not address the broader systemic issues, which we must. And that means expanding Pell Grants, making investment in tuition-free college, treating education, higher education as the public good that it is, and uh, investing um, in our uh, chronically uh, underfunded, historically black colleges and universities, while also uh, stabilizing the other things that are uh, burdening our families. We have to make the child tax credit permanent. Uh, we have to address universal child care and pre-K. We have to address stagnant wages and housing costs. Uh, we have to holistically support every individual and family so that everyone can thrive. And so um, with that, again, thank you all for joining us. A thank you to all of my partners and colleagues uh, in government uh, for supporting us in our, in our collective advocacy. Um, we are very excited about this $1 million investment in our human infrastructure. And again, thank you to our students, of whom I expect great things from all of you. And uh, I feel a little bit smarter just being in your presence, uh, especially since I was never a math student. <laughs> um, but uh, again, just... Uh, wishing you all the best of success, particularly as you head into finals, and you were certainly very deserving uh, of this investment. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, yeah, of course. Yeah.